since I've been the last first photograph I've seen of anybody. And who is that photograph? It's one of my sons. I can't remember his name. Tragic. Clive Waring, this remarkable man, shows us how central memory is to our existence. Without it, life is empty, it is meaningless. How then do we go about studying this magical process of memory? It is convenient to divide the study of memory into two parts, the systems problem of memory and the molecular problem of memory. In the systems problem of memory, we ask where in the brain is memory stored? In the molecular problem of memory, we go from mind to molecule. We add a mechanism whereby this storage occurs. In tomorrow's lecture, we're going to go from mind to molecules and consider the molecular, the molecular underpinnings of memory storage. Today, we're going to discuss the systems problem of memory. Historically, the systems problem of memory addressed an even larger issue, and that is, can any mental process be localized to the brain? The first person to address this question was a Viennese physician by the name of Franz Joseph Gall, an extremely interesting character who had a lot of insights into the brain. Two of them were so profound that we continue to carry them and, and entertain them very seriously today. They're, they're fundamental to brain science. The first idea was that all mental functions are biological. They come from the brain. He did away with the idea of dualism that Descartes was advocating, the idea that there, is aspect, there are aspects of mind which are outside the body, they're spiritual. He said every mental process from the simplest reflex to the most extraordinary symphony that Beethoven was composing, these are all products of the mind. He made the second point that the brain is specialized, and particularly the outer part of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the covering of the brain, doesn't function as a single organ. It's a number of different organs, each of them mediating a different mental function. Now, in order to localize mental functions, he had some knowledge of the brain. He knew that the brain was a bilateral symmetrical structure. It had a left hemisphere, it had a right hemisphere. He knew that it was a convoluted structure. It had infoldings called sulci and outpouching called gyri. These infoldings provide a means whereby you can take a large surface area like the cerebral cortex and pack it into a smaller space so you can put it safely within the skull. He also knew that the brain had four lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. And he began to think how to localize mental functions. And when he first began, he realized that four functions are more than, not enough to explain what needs to be explained. An inadequate number of subdivisions. He needed more than four subdivisions because when he read the literature in psychology and from his own clinical experience, he realized there were more than 40 different mental functions that he had to localize. So the question is, how was he to do this? Uh, one way to do this is through clinical pathological correlations, to take people like Clive Waring and see where is the lesion when one has a deficit in memory. But he decided he would do this a different way. He would do this by observing people very carefully. He didn't want to study the diseased brain. And he decided there would be 40 different functions, and he identified them in different regions in the following way. He put the intellectual functions like comparison, thinking, cautiousness at the front of the brain. He put the emotional functions like romantic love, parental love at the back of the brain. And he put sentiments like hope, uh, happiness in the middle of the brain. Now, how did he decide to go about doing this? He thought himself a very careful observer. And it struck him that one clue to how the brain works is to look at the shape of people's skulls. Because he was struck with the fact that people with different shaped skulls had different character structures, different kinds of personalities. And he thought that by looking at people's, the bumps on their skull, he could get a very deep insight in how they functioned as intellectual and social human beings. The first thing that gave him a clue about this was the fact that when he looked at the brightest people he knew, both among his classmates and among his teachers, he found that they had a very prominent forehead, often had bulging eyes. And those that had a more shallow intellect had a more restricted uh, forehead and sometimes a more prominent back of the head. 
I was extremely skeptical of this view. I thought this was just blatant nonsense. How can we make an assertion like that? But then I began to look around among my friends, and I began to explore them and look at their heads. And I found to my amazement that Tom Jessel, <laughs> one of my brightest friends, had a very prominent forehead, and some of the people in our group who had a shallow... <laughs> Back, uh, uh, you know, a shallow intellect had a, a less prominent forehead. So I really began to think that maybe there's something to this. And I began to read more about Gaul. How did he get to this view? And he really developed a very, very interesting theory. He thought that if you use your function, like Tom uses his intellect, that part of the brain that represents that function for example, a function of comparison, intellectual function, that would bulk up like a muscle when you're exercising. And that would cause the overlying skull to bulge out. And this made an enormous impact. People, when they first read about this, got very excited. And I could see there might be some merit to this. Uh, may I have a volunteer? Would you consider coming up here for one second? Sure. What is your name? Carrie. Carrie. Would you turn around? May I examine your head? Sure. It, no, face that. Well, it's clear. I don't even have to do much palpation to see extremely intelligent person. <laughs> Thank you very much. May I suggest that all of you, with appropriate permission from your neighbor, turn to your right and palpate the skull of the person next to you to get an idea whom you're sitting next to. I, you don't want to spend the rest of your life with people that you don't know. I want to tell you... Please, go ahead. <laughs> I should also tell you, so you not only evaluate people for their intellectual capabilities, because after all, we make friends on more than one quality of mind, the back of the head is involved in romance. So you can get a sense of how romantic the person is sitting next to you. The French were more skeptical. The French tend to be very skeptical. And um, the the person to really challenge this in a very dramatic way was a giant in the field whom I like very much, uh, Pierre Paul Broca. Uh, he, um, in about 1861, so it's about 40 years after Gaul, said, look, I think that all mental functions come from the brain, and I think it's very likely that mental functions can be localized to specific regions, but this is not the way to go about it, by feeling people's skulls. You have to get inside and see what's going on in the brain. And so he argued, I had thought if there were a phrenological science that is a localization of function, it would be phrenology of convolutions uh, of the cortex, not a phrenology of bumps in the head. And therefore he suggested that mental functions could be localized to specific regions, but by correlating clinical pathological uh, information. So he thought that if one examined people with specific disorders of brain function, see what symptoms that produces, one would le really learn something. And he began to look around, and he decided he would study, uh, a, uh, he would study aphasia, a disorder of language, because he thought this was the highest mental function. If you get any insight into the biological base of language, you'd have a real insight into mental processes. And s soon after he became interested in it, he came across a fascinating patient, Le Bourne. Le Bourne had an extremely interesting disorder of language, an extremely interesting aphasia, in the sense that he could understand language perfectly well, but could not express himself with language. Now, you might think this is a paralysis of the vocal cords, but it was not. He could whistle a tune perfectly well. He could hum a tune very well. Moreover, he could not express himself in language and writing. He simply could not express himself in language, even though his understanding of language is perfectly well. When he died and came to autopsy, Broca found that there was a lesion in his brain at the front of the brain. He was now in a peculiar situation. He discovered this lesion in the front of the brain, and he wanted to name it. He wanted to write a paper about it. He wanted to discuss it with people, and he didn't know what to call it. So in all modesty, he ended up naming it after himself. What choice did he have? He called it Broca's area. He then collected seven other patients that had a similar aphasia, difficulty in articulating language, but not a difficulty in understanding it. And he found that every one of those patients, 
had a lesion in the front of the brain, and in each case, the lesion was on the left side.